One of the coolest things in maths is prime numbers, and they make up a big chunk of number theory. Prime numbers are the series of whole numbers that can't be divided by smaller numbers except for one, which is called the unit. Broadly speaking, that means that there are two types of whole numbers greater than the unit. There are the prime numbers, and there are the numbers that aren't primes. Those are called composite numbers because they can be composed by multiplying prime numbers together. If you've looked at anything to do with prime numbers, you've seen the sieve of Eratosthenes, and it's a really handy way of visualizing prime numbers and composite numbers. You've probably seen it on a 10 by 10 grid, which makes some sense because we use a base 10 number system, and it's familiar, but the concept isn't wedded to being 10 columns wide. After spending not too long looking at a 10 column wide table, we can understand that none of the numbers that end in 2, 4, 5, 6, 8 or 0 are primes, but besides that, people tend to treat the grid format like they would a one-dimensional number line. There's no real advantage in stacking the number line into a grid. A more highly composite number, like 6 or 30, would be better than 10, but ultimately, if the width of the table stays static, it's of little value, as you can mark off multiples of numbers higher than 2, 3, and 5 on a one-dimensional line almost as easily. It's good for education, but not much more. I think there's a better way of representing this sieve than a table with 10 columns. I think it works better with a table where the width of the table changes. If you have a table that has two columns, then all of the even numbers are in the second column. If you then increase the width to three, all of the numbers in the right-hand column are multiples of three, and so on. Whatever the width, it always starts with one, and if you exclude the top row, the right-hand column is always composite, always. You can literally see that each number appearing in the right column is the product of the width and the height of the table. Like all sieves, the sieve of Eratosthenes is less of a prime finder and more of a composite finder. When the width of the table is odd, all of the primes line up on a diagonal and you get some pretty patterns. If the width of the table is even, all of the primes line up vertically. When the table has six columns, you can see that all primes greater than three line up on these two vertical lines. When the table has seven columns, you can see the same two columns, but now they're on two diagonal lines. If you start at five and seven and add six repeatedly, you can be guaranteed to hit every single prime number greater than three, but you're also going to hit a bunch of composites too. Every fifth number is divisible by five, every seventh number is divisible by seven, and so on. Because the primes are in these two columns or in these two diagonals, it's pretty easy to see the twin primes. Those are the prime numbers that are two numbers apart, like 17 and 19, or 29 and 31. Now we don't yet know if there are infinitely many of these or not. In its unoptimized form, you can brute force it and have columns of every width, but you can optimize the sieve by only picking the widths corresponding to prime numbers. But to do this, you need to know and have a way of recording what the smaller primes are. Here I've highlighted the numbers that you could reasonably say won't be made composite by increasing the width of the table to a larger number. Those are the primes smaller than the square of the width of the table. So a table of width 5 gets you all the primes to 25. Now, quick note, by creating a table of numbers we're effectively wrapping the number line when we get to a particular width. Each row has more numbers to the right and to the left but we're hiding them because they're duplicates. The sieve of Eratosthenes is what I'd call a low processor, but high memory algorithm. It's low processor in that you can draw lines down whole columns of composite numbers. There's no division required and no complex calculations. Unfortunately, it only works when you start from 1. You can't skip ahead and put, say, 101 in the top left corner, because that's not evenly divisible by a bunch of smaller numbers. The sieve works pretty well, but you have to work up to it. So it becomes memory hungry, and it only really works on smaller numbers. It is, though, a really easy way of teaching people about prime numbers. So to recap, the sieve of Eratosthenes has pros and cons. It doesn't require any calculations. It's simple to understand. It does a great job of finding composites, and it's optimizable. But it's also memory hungry. It works best on small numbers, and to get the most out of it, you need to find a way of changing the dimensions of the table. I think there's a better way of representing a sieve like this. I've taken the idea of dynamic widths, but instead of changing the width of the whole table, 
Every time the number in the right-hand column is a square number, I've wrapped the number line to the next line. I've then right-justified the whole thing, so all of the square numbers line up down this right-hand column. For now, I'm also going to show all of the positive whole numbers to the left as well. So effectively, each row has all of the numbers smaller than the square number that's in the right-hand column. You can see that all of the positive numbers are listed, but it also means that there's a lot of duplication. But bear with me. Next, I'm going to highlight all of the prime numbers. There's no clear pattern to the primes. There are some interesting diagonal lines, which I'll get back to, but nothing that's uninterrupted. We'd confidently predict where the primes were. There are, however, some really clear patterns to the composites. You'll see that when you square an even number, you get an even number. And when you square an odd number, you get an odd number. So every second row in the right-hand column is an even number. So as a result, you get a grid pattern where all of the even and odd numbers alternate on each line. You may also see some columns that are always composite below the top number in that column. Always. If you count from right to left, these are the columns that correspond to square numbers. So this column is the original square numbers. This column is the original square numbers minus 1 squared, minus 2 squared, 3 squared, and so on forever. I'm now going to hide all of the non-square columns. In doing this, we get rid of a lot of the duplication, but we also lose all of the numbers that leave a remainder of 2 when you divide them by 4. So 2, 6, 10, etc. But besides the number 2, none of these 2 mod 4 numbers are prime. You can see pretty clearly that all the odd numbers are listed at least once along this top diagonal line, and in some cases they're listed elsewhere as well. The ones listed in more than one place are the composite odd numbers. They're the prime killers. There's also a bunch of even numbers. In the same way that the top diagonal line is all of the odd numbers, the second line is all of the numbers evenly divisible by 4. These remaining columns are effectively a visualization of the difference of two square numbers. 9 minus 1, 25 minus 4, etc. The only numbers in these columns that might or might not be composite are the tops of each columns. These are the numbers where the two square numbers are consecutive squares. So 3 squared minus 2 squared, or 6 squared minus 5 squared, and so on. We can see algebraically that the only way that an odd number can be prime is where the two numbers are consecutive. Because if we call the two square numbers x squared and y squared, we can write this as x minus y multiplied by x plus y. And the only way that that's not composite is where x minus y equals 1. So the top diagonal line is all of the odd numbers, which means that if an odd number appears in a second place anywhere lower than that line, that number is a composite. A number like 9 is on the top diagonal line, and it's 5 squared minus 4 squared, but it's also 3 squared minus 0 squared. A number like 15 is 8 squared minus 7 squared, but it's also 4 squared minus 1 squared. We can see that all prime numbers greater than 2 can be expressed as the difference of two squares in only one way. Besides the prime numbers only appearing on the top diagonal row and the right-hand column being consecutive square numbers, there's also a number of interesting patterns here. Like the table from before I hid the non-square columns, the even numbers form a grid, so half the numbers can be ignored. These correspond to either where the two square numbers are both even, or where the two square numbers are both odd. Now I said before that the numbers appearing in the second diagonal line are all even. What's a little harder to see is that the diagonal line third from the top are all divisible by 3. This is where x minus y equals 3. The diagonal line below that, the fourth line, are all divisible by 4, and so on forever. We can prove this algebraically too. If instead of using x squared minus y squared for the two squares, we say that y is some number smaller than x, let's call it a, the formula now becomes x squared minus x minus a, all squared, which expands to x minus x minus a multiplied by x plus x minus a, or a times something, which means that a is always a factor. As before, if x minus y is 1, then 1 is a factor. But equally, if x minus y is 10, then 10 is a factor. If you then look at the opposite diagonal, you can see the same pattern. The second line is divisible by 2, the third by 3, and so on forever. This means that a number like 33 
can be represented as 7 squared minus 4 squared, and we can also see that its factors are 7 minus 4 and 7 plus 4, or 3 and 11. In testing a random number for primality, you might see people testing by trial division. In this context, effectively they're seeing if the number appears on this diagonal line, or this diagonal line, or this diagonal line. Trial division works okay on relatively small numbers, but it becomes processor intensive. But a number like 77 that isn't evenly divisible by 2 or 3 or 5 is still clearly a composite number because it's 4 fewer than 81. And it turns out that its factors are 9 minus 2 and 9 plus 2, or 7 and 11. So now we have a sieve and a primality test. If an odd number is a square number short of another square number, it's not a prime number, unless the two square numbers are consecutive. But these square numbers get very big very fast, and like trial division, it's not a particularly efficient way of testing if a number is composite. But we can set some theoretical upper and lower bounds pretty easily, and then we can improve on the upper bound. We can then also optimise within these bounds, so we're effectively able to box in the problem and then target it. We can set a lower bound for how large the larger square needs to be. A number like 33 is never going to be a smaller square number minus something, because it's already larger than the smaller square. So the lower bound is the next square number higher than the prime candidate. For a number like 33, whose square root is 5 point something, we'd round up and start testing at 6 squared. Every odd number can be expressed as the difference of two consecutive square numbers, and we can say exactly which numbers they'll be. If we halve the odd number, that'll always give us something and a half. We can then add a half and subtract a half to get the two consecutive numbers we need to square. Half of 33, for example, is 16.5, and if we add a half and subtract a half, we can see that 33 is definitely 17 squared minus 16 squared. We can also see that two of its factors are 17 minus 16 and 17 plus 16, or 1 and 33. If we test a number up to this bound and we only find one example where the prime candidate is the difference of two squares, then the number is prime. If it's more than once, it's a composite. I'm calling this half plus a half a theoretical upper bound because it can't be higher than this, but we can immediately improve on it. This theoretical upper bound is for all odd numbers, not just the primes. So there's no point in testing that high because the odd number might or might not be a composite. Put another way, all numbers have one as a factor. So we don't need to test all the way up to this theoretical upper bound, and we only need to test to a practical upper bound that's lower than the theoretical upper bound. That way, if we find any example where the number is the difference of two squares, it's composite. While we're setting a practical upper bound, if we're only testing odd numbers, then we know that two isn't a factor. So we don't have to test to whether two numbers to square are two apart, and we can set a lower practical upper bound. You may see where this is going already, but we can use this method of testing for primality in concert with trial division. If through trial division or some other method we can quickly determine if a number is not divisible by 2 or 3 or 5, then the minimum possible divisor is 7, and we can write a similar formula to determine the practical upper bound. In general, the upper bound is the prime candidate divided by twice the minimum possible divisor plus half the minimum possible divisor, rounded down, and then all squared. In the case where the numbers are one apart, as per our previous example of 33, the revised formula gives us the same thing, which is the same as saying half plus one half. If at any point the rounding isn't necessary, then the number is divisible by that minimum divisor. Even without optimization, compared to the sieve of Eratosthenes, there's a number of positives. In particular, the column widths are static, and despite each row being different lengths, those lengths follow a very predictable pattern. The numbers we're dealing with are either multiplied, that's to say that they're squared, or they're subtracted, and potentially this is less processor intensive than division or modularity needed for trial division. Now we can use this in concert with trial division, and we can start at any number. So you can jump ahead to a million and know with certainty that a million minus nine is a composite, and you know with certainty that its factors are 1000 minus three multiplied by 1000 plus three or 997 and 1003. If you find a number isn't prime, you also find two of its factors. And you don't require any prior knowledge or storage of prime numbers to find prime numbers, which is kind of cool.
So far, this is the version of the primality test, which can use trial division in concert with the method to reduce the upper bound. We've boxed in the problem, but it's yet to be targeted. So that's my attempt at improving on the sieve of Eratosthenes, but I'm not a mathematician and I'm just making stuff up. So there's every chance that something that I've said is wrong. Similarly, there's probably things that I've said that have an official name that I've just got no idea what they're called. If that's the case, then please let me know so that I can fix it. In the subsequent videos, I look at modularity and optimization. I also look at some number series that have similar properties to prime numbers, but uh, for even numbers and square numbers. I also look at some quadratic progressions that relates to twin primes. And I also look at a function that creates an increased probability of finding prime numbers. Please don't like or subscribe because it'll only encourage me.